Try that again. I'm going to pick up where I left off last week. Uh, we are almost done with the week three content. Um, I went through the slides yesterday. I didn't upload the updated slides to the to Brightspace because actually I took slides out from the end of it, where there was like 10 slides about an example, but I'd already used all tons of examples as it was. And then I looked at the slides for week four and there was another 10 useless slides at the end. So if all goes well, we're gonna get through most of the content today and we'll be pretty much caught up. The reason why I need to get through it is because this is when I released the first assignment to you guys is this week. Therefore, I need to have a little bit of time to talk about that towards the end. We've padded week five, so there's gap time in five to make up for time we might have lost elsewhere, but I'd like to at least get through as much of three and four as possible. Yes. Uh, no, I didn't upload them. I, the ones that are there now has more content than what I'm going to cover in class. So they're just good for you guys to have as reference. Yeah, I just I just literally cut the ends off so I know where to stop. All right, so last week I had finished talking about the different symbols for, you know, uh, crow's foot. We were about to dive into something called strong and weak entities. And these two are fairly straightforward concept. A strong entity is an entity that represents something that can exist on its own. A good example is a person, you know, a car can exist onto itself because it can identify itself. Um, a weak entity is an entity who, whose existence depends on the existence of another piece of information. So for example, if we were gonna go back to the person, I mean, actually, let's go with the building and the apartment example. A building can exist without an apartment, but an apartment cannot exist without a building. A weak entity is basically any piece of data that cannot exist without something to define it. Um, Another easy example for you guys to understand would be uh, you ordered something from Amazon. You have an order number. Each of the things you have in your order cannot exist if you haven't placed an order. That is a weak entity. Um, that's literally all there is to it between the two. So normally a weak entity, when it has identifiers and primary keys, often the primary key of the parent is also carried as part of the primary key of the weak entity. Um, depending how you do your database design, you know, that may or may not be applicable. It could still be a weak entity, even though it doesn't have the parent's primary key as part of its primary key. But in the traditional sense, that's what that means. So an ID dependent entity, and also known as a weak entity, is a an entity, a child record, whose identifier includes the identifier of the parent, which is what I literally just said. Um, and some examples are an extension of the subunit. So a building has an apartment. If you're an artist and you have paintings, you may have prints. The prints cannot exist without the painting. Um, the minimum cardinality from a weak entity to the parent is always one. In other words, there must be one and only one parent to that record. And if you're wondering what that looks like when you draw it, It helps when you dig in the right pocket. Back to my happy whiteboard over here. If we have two entities, A, B, this is the weak entity, this is the strong entity. The relationship on the weak entity is there must be one and always one parent. It can't have more than one parent because that's not how one to many works. Now, there are identifying 
relationships. And that is, depending on the diagramming software you're using, it may or may not actually do these lines. Um, so when you have a an identifying relationship, in other words, you have this set up and primary this one. So let's say we have something called ID in here and we have, you know, A ID and B ID as its primary key. This is identifying relationship carried from the parent into the child. And you draw that with a solid line. Like I said, not all diagramming software supports it. But if it does, that's what it means. On the other hand, if we have a this set, this is a non-identifying relationship. In other words, um, in theory, no, I'm doing yeah, I'm doing that right. This has an ID. This has an ID. This one might still be one to me, but it's still able to exist without the parent. So for an example of this in the real world, um, you know when you order something from Amazon, you don't know how it's going to get shipped until it literally ships? That means that the order and the items can exist without a reference to a parent called shipping methods. However, once the record is updated, now there is a reference. That shipping method is probably used by multiple orders, obviously. But by the same token, it doesn't identify the order. It just happens to be a property of the order. That's the difference between a non-identifying and identifying. And I guess I should write it on there. And that probably looks about that big to the people in the back row. There's not much I can do about that. So here's some examples where you've got a building, name, street address, and then there's apartments. In this case, they use the building name as the primary key, which, you know, if you've lived in Ottawa long enough, you might remember a building called the Palladium which became, uh, heck, what was it? Scotiabank Place and then Canadian Tech. Oh yeah, Corral Center and then Corral disappeared. And uh, well, they were bought out by an investment group and then it became Scotiabank Place and now it's Canadian Tire, right? So not the best identifier, but we'll go with it for the example. You have a building name and in the apartment, the primary key is built up the, prim the building name and the apartment number. So it's the same idea as what I drew over here. Same thing here, painting name has a painting name and the copy number for a print, and then a patient plus their exam date, which is also stupid um, because the patient could have more than one exam in one day. But you know, we'll go with it. So the patient name identifies the patient, the exam is identified by the patient's name and the exam date. So those are examples of weak entities. These three down here, cannot exist without something up there. Great, understandable, vaguely, kind of. Yeah, these are the strong entities because they can exist. Yeah, but the weak ones cannot exist without this. It's sort of like, you know, the person that has a significant other that doesn't exist unless they have a significant other because they're weak. And only about half the people in the room got that route that one. Wait till you get older. Okay. So non uh, ID dependent weak entities. Um, so all ID dependent entities are considered weak. And when they use the phrase ID, they mean identifier dependent. In other words, this one is dependent via the identifier. That's why it's a weak entity. Um, there are also such a thing as non-identifier dependent weak entities. Um, the identifier parent does not appear in the identifier of the weak child. 
Um, here they've got uh, an auto model, manufacturer and model with some stuff. Uh, down here, um, this is a weak one. This is a uh, non-weak, or it's a strong, a, a non-identifying, not non-weak, damn. Uh, non-identifying, so you got the manufacturer and the model in the auto model, but the actual vehicle is identified by the VIN. And what is kind of weird is that they didn't include, with this kind of diagram, which is the same idea as this, normally you don't show the foreign keys on the conceptual diagram, and this is that strange box form conceptual diagram. And I know why they're using it in the slides, is because it doesn't take up as much room. And once you turn this into a physical diagram, these two fields will be showing up down here, but they're not part of the key. So if you're talking about a weak entity that does not have its parent ID as part of its primary key, that is else it can be a weak entity because the car can't exist without a manufacturer and a model. Um, but it's still, a, but it's it is a you know non-dependent via the identifier. So, in summary, a weak entity is an entity that it, that whose existence depends on another entity, also known as a strong entity. Um, an ID-dependent entity means it has the parent's ID as part of its primary key. Identifying relationships are used to represent these, also known as the ones with the straight strong line without dashes. Some entities are weak, but they're not ID dependent. Um, and these are shown as non-identifying, like that. And I covered crow's foot quite well last week. I'm gonna skip this slide, uh, but it's actually pretty good for you guys. This is a slide that has a, you know, a fair amount of decent information on it. Um, it shows the different whatever's with a nice long description. All right, so strong entity relationship patterns. There's three basic relationship types when you're talking about strong, strong entities. You've got one-to-one, one to one, one to many, and many to many. That's what NM means. And so this one here is showing a one-to-one -one relationship between lockers and a person. I just had to remember what this is for. So. You've got, you know, the name, the member's name here, the member number at 1,000. You can see that each person is only allowed to have one locker. Uh, you guys probably have had the experience going through Access trying to get a locker. It only, if I remember right, you're only allowed to rent one locker at a time. If you don't want your locker, if you want a locker in a different building, you've got to, you know, give up your locker and move it. I strongly recommend that if you're going to move your locker, that you uh, empty it before you change it on Access. Otherwise, what will happen is what happened with my daughter. She realized that her classes were moving, so she moved her locker the night before she came in the next day for her first class. She goes, I'll grab my shit and move it. Locker had already been cut off because somebody else rented the locker right behind her, showed up and called them to cut the lock off. <laughs> so, you know, just saying. That's a real-life anecdote pro tip for you. Um, so this set of slides would resolve to something that looks like this if you're looking for a diagram of it. So it's a one-to-one -one non-identifying relationship. Again, because this is a conceptual box style, the for the pair, the foreign key is not showing up in here. It would in the physical diagram. And this is a one-to-many relationship. Um, and man, that's small. Heck, I can't even, I'm glued to it. Uh, just take my word for it, that basically what's happening is this piece right here populates this row. So it's the same idea as an order from Amazon or your grocery order at Loblaws, same idea. And how would it be mapped out? It would be something like this. Uh, this is a one-to-many um, non-identifying, in other words, the uniforms are available without the club member. The club member can exist without the uniform. 
uh, but it's saying that the club member can have multiple uniforms. And when you think about it, for people that have played hockey or baseball, you have home uniforms and away uniforms, and usually practice uniforms. So in theory, you probably have, you know, at least three sets of uniforms, depending on what kind of sports you play. And uh, this is a many-to-many. Um, it's really terrible to lay out. Um, but the diagram shows it like this, that the company can have many parts, and that part can be sold to many companies. So an example of this would be, um, well, auto dealerships are a really good example, right? Like each garage, especially dealerships, will stock a certain amount of parts. And they will all stock similar parts. For example, brake pads, brake, you know, your rotors, uh, the common pieces, the light bulbs, tires, rims, don't know, the, the things that they change on a regular basis. They'll keep a bit of stock of that. But the thing is that they'll have multiple parts. And each of those parts can also go to multiple dealerships. So each part itself belongs to only one dealership. However, each dealership can order multiple parts. And that same part can be ordered by multiple dealerships, which ends up being a many-to-many -many relationship. Was that, as, was that clear as mud? Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, an understandable concept. I can turn it around with uh, Loblaws and Bananas. And apples, right? Loblaw stocks all kinds of produce, and all the grocery stores all pretty much carry the same kind of produce. And there's a 50 50 chance they all get it from the same supplier. So that supplier supplies bananas to, you know, every grocery store in Ottawa. And, you know, every grocery store in Ottawa can order bananas from that supplier. And they can order apples and oranges. All right. So that was the end of week three. We're making good time. Now to go open up week four. Wrong. Okay, so week four, which is where we're supposed to be right now. So over the last three weeks, I have caught up to about two hours of lecture material. Not bad. Week four is about physical design. So it's about taking that and turning it into a, an actual design you'd use on a database server. So most of these slides are MySQL specific. I will identify things that are not MySQL specific because I tried to teach this course, this course, what the heck word was that? This course as close to uh, what they call ANSI standard. Uh, what ANSI standard means, it means that there's a certain standard that applies to all database servers. And then there's the database specific flavors of all these extra little things. Um, so that's my preamble into this. So a database design is a set of specifications that can be implemented for database in a database management system. So essentially, a database model is transformed into a database design. And the data model is generic, generalized, non-database specific. Like this is not database system specific. The database design, on the other hand, is specific to the target. For example, it's just like um, the bolts that hold your license plate on your car. So if you have a Japanese car, those bolts are metric. To be precise, they're 10 mils. If you get a North American car, those bolts probably uh, three-eighths. They're specific to the car. Just like you can't take the brake pads from my Mitsubishi Outlander and slap them on my daughter's little lunchbox Nissan Micra. Micra. You know, my brake pads are that big. Hers are like the size of this. 
It's the same idea with database design. They are not, they are specific to the target. Now there are things you can do to mitigate the variations between the database systems by using generic data types, not implementing database server specific features, that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, what you do in MySQL will be very different than what you do in SQL Server or in Oracle. You can minimize the amount of differences between them. So database design is the logical design plus some physical design. So we've talked about conceptual for like the last week and a half, almost two weeks. The logical design and the physical design are almost the exact same thing. So what we're gonna talk about database design in today's lecture is, is the logical design plus some of the stuff from the physical design. It's the closest way to make it generic as possible. So when you're doing database design, there's some requirements gathering. You do some normalization, which is the topic for week five, and then diagramming. So when you are leaving the realm of conceptual and going to the world of logical and physical, you have to start establishing something called business rules. And a business rule is a statement of policy that describes what a process validates. In other words, what happens to the data? It does not care how the policy is enforced, conducted, or how it's implemented. So why do you want to use business rules? It's so that when you are doing a database design, if you set out clear business rules, you will end up with a database design that is probably closer to what needs to happen as opposed to just winging it. Um, I don't know if anybody in here has ever done a project by just winging it. Um, you've probably experienced how it doesn't go well. And I'm not talking about just computers. You decide to build a catio. And you're like, oh, I've got some wood and some chicken wire. I'm going to build myself a catio so that my expensive cat's going to go sit outside and get some sunlight. I think you just start cutting, and then you discover that you really suck at winging it. Doing a database design and winging it is even worse because it's usually a lot harder to fix. Business rules can apply to people, processes, behavior, various systems in an organization. So, a sample of a business rule, and there's an awful lot of text on this slide, but it's basically saying that this company will give a discount to anybody who spends at least $5,000 a year. So, a sample of a business rule could be stated as if a customer spends about $5,000 in a one year period, then give them a 10% discount on everything else purchased by that customer. That is a business rule that is stated. And there's lots of companies that do this. Um, like my day job, we used to do it with uh, our resellers. If they reach a certain target number of sales, we actually give them a bigger margin. So they might get, you know, 20% of the sale for the first hundred thousand dollars they sell of our stuff then they might get you know 20 23 percent 25 percent ongoing through the year then the calendar year resets and they're back to 20 percent so the business rules are the foundation of a data model they represent the language and the structure of the organization and they're derived from you know procedures and events there are constraints that are specific to the rules and the rules provide a formal way so that is a way for the programmers and the database developers to understand what the stakeholders want. So you'd list off the business rules and you'd bring in 
everybody who's involved, and you go through the business rules going, this is how I understand your business operates. Is this correct? And normally, they'll say, yes, it makes sense, or no, it does not. And essentially, in the end, uh, business rules are known as constraints in the system. And for example, an order from Loblaws must contain products. That's a business rule. It'd be as if you walked into Loblaws, went to self-checkout, checked out without buying anything, swipe your card, they don't take off any money, and you walk out the door. That's not an order. That was just a waste of oxygen. And a waste of time for everybody involved. So a rule would state for it to be a valid order, there must be at least one product bought. So the business rules will determine how the data is created, how it's stored, retrieved, data administration. Um, the ERD, the constraints are represented in it, often using, um, well, the crow's foot diagram, right? One to many, many to one, you know, mandatory, not mandatory. Um, it's integral to the database design. Um, and they, whoever wrote these slides really likes repeating policies, rules, and practice. What we are discovering is that, you know, sometimes the rules and policies, as you understand them, is not how everybody that have a stake in the project understand it. And there's some negotiation. So this is the important slide. Of everything I just talked about, this is the important one. And yes, it's on Brightspace. So a business rule must be declarative. Decra, declarative. Can't talk today. A business rule is a statement of policy and describes what a process validates, but doesn't describe how it's enforced. It must be clear. It must be precise. A rule must only have one interpretation. So if you state a rule such as, to pass the class, students must attend the class. That's a clear rule. Now, if I were to sit down with five students and ask them, do you understand these rules? Are they clear to you? And one of them says, what do you mean by attend? Suddenly the rules no longer clear for everybody who's involved. Therefore, it will need to be reworded so that everybody who is communicating over this rule understands its meaning. And it must be in simple, plain language. It's atomic. A rule is indivisible, yet sufficient. In other words, here's a simple rule. To receive a grade for a piece of work, you must submit the piece of work. That can't be divided. Grade equals submission. It, you can't take it and make three separate rules out of it because it's one rule. It, the rule must be consistent. Uh, a rule must be internally and externally consistent. In other words, it has to be consistent unto itself, but it also has to be consistent with the other rules around it. So here's a few examples of consistent rules. To receive a grade, you must submit the assignment. A late assignment will be applied a 10% penalty. An assignment later than two weeks will receive a zero. Those are three separate rules. They're consistent unto themselves, but they're also consistent with everything else around it. Because you cannot give a person a 10% penalty on something that didn't get graded because they never submitted it. So it's consistent with the other rules. Maybe the wording could be improved. You could say a piece of work submitted late will receive a 10% penalty because now we're including the word submitted in two places so the rules reference each other and they're clear. Can't be divided, it's more obvious. A rule must be expressible. In other words, you have to be able to say it to the target audience in a language they will understand and it's understandable. If you're working with somebody who speaks English, and you state it in Swahili, it's not a valid business rule because they don't understand it. On the same token, if I speak an English rule to an English speaker, 
there's no reason that rule shouldn't be able to be understood. It must be expressible by both parties. In other words, both parties must be able to repeat it and understand what it means. And it must be distinct. Business rules are not to be redundant. But a rule may refer to other rules, like my example with the great late submissions. None of those were redundant to each other. By the same token, none of them were repeated. And they were still referred to each other clearly. In other words, if you have the same rule twice and they just mince words a little bit, like one's worded one way and the other one's worded a little bit differently, it's time to re-examine those two business rules to decide whether or not they're valid. So, to summarize the business rules, um, essentially, when you're doing a database design and you're dealing with stakeholders, and by the way, for example, for assignment one, guess who the stakeholder is? Because I'm the one that approves or not approves your submissions, right? So. Imagine you're working at your job and you want to make sure you're doing the best job possible. So you're going to list off the known business rules on how a system interacts. It doesn't necessarily need to be super complex, but what you want to do is make sure that the stakeholders understand how you interpret their needs. And you're going to do it with nice short sentences without big words. Because the sh nice short sentences without big words is easier for people to understand. There's less room for misinterpretation. Um, it's a bit like license agreements, right? We've all read these wonderful license agreements. You get your cell phone by opening the sealed packages. You're agreeing to the license agreement inside the box, which, by the way, is totally legal. But you know, you buy you you are because the first page of the agreement says you are. And you read it, and it's totally non-understandable without someone without a law degree. What I really appreciate is when a lot of companies will give you, you know, the, the point form version of these are the rules as we understand them. Uh, you may not use your cell phone to make bombs. You may not use your cell phone for doing, you know, bad activities. If you break your cell phone, it's your fault. You take pictures of yourself and send them to someone. It's not our fault. Those are nice, clear business rules based on the legal agreements. Um, that is the point of business rules, is to make sure that you deliver something usable. So now that we've gotten business rules out of the way, now we're going to talk about actually converting one of these guys into a database design. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to create a table for each of these entities. So if I were to take a diagram that is pretty basic, I don't know where the eraser is. Oh, that's obvious. I think my hand was better. So if I have an entity that looks like this, And I'm just going to leave it at three, like that. So what this will become is this will become a table called student. And each of these attributes will become columns or fields, depending which word you want to use. And then you will define the properties for each column. So to go back over here to draw.
we define a few different things. Null status, the data type, any default values, and if there's any constraints. Now, two of these I can't do, but I at least can show this. So for example, should student's name be able to be null? No, because then they're a non-entity. So they'd be not null. Phone number and email. One of them probably should be populated at least. So let's go with the phone number. And the other thing we do is we pick a data type. And we'll be talking about data types in a minute. But not the name is a character field. Remember, same thing, and so is the email. So all three of these are going to be character character types. And the most common data type we're going to use is varcar. And we're going to go the same thing all the way down. I'm actually going to do it on MySQL, MySQL Workbench in a moment. Um, so we assign it the data types. Uh, default values, if applicable. Um, and data constraints, if there's any, you can actually set some rules in the database design saying uh, quantity cannot be less than one. It'll give you an error. So, for example, you're buying something from Amazon and you want to buy negative three. You know, Amazon is going to let you buy negative three of something just because you want some money out of their system. That's not how that works. That's an example of a data constraint. Um, you're going to verify normalization. Like I said, we're going to talk about that later. Then we create the relationships by creating foreign keys. Um, this will be way easier if I just do it in MySQL Workbench. It's trying, OK? This is MySQL Workbench. Well, this is part of step one and step two. I'm going to show you step one, then step two at the same time, one after another. So this is my student table that I have on the board. I'm actually going to use the same naming as I did over there. And we're going to add the student's name. We know it's a var car. And of course, it doesn't like that. Because of the way it works. And right now it's set to not null. Uh, MySQL has a bunch of other flags. Uh, for now, I'm going to skip pretty much all of them. Uh, the two important ones you need to worry about is PK, which stands for primary key, and not null. Uh, this is unique, binary. Unsigned if it's a number, uh, zero fill, it'll pad the number with zeros, because why not? Uh, auto incrementing and uh, it's generated. So again, we're going to add in uh, phone number, leave that as a varcar 45. And we said that one was not null. And that's their e email. I'm going to talk about the data types in a minute. And leave that as var car 45. Right now, as you can see, I don't have any primary keys defined. Nothing of that nature. Um, so step two is as if I had another table. Let's call it courses. Course number. I will leave it like that. And what step two is talking about is creating the relationships. So creating the relationships in MySQL Workbench is actually pretty straightforward. You have your different tools down the side. So you got one-to-one, -one, non-identifying, one-to-many, non-identifying, one-to-one, one-to-many. And I always do this backwards at least once. Click on the child, click on the parent, and the, it's not letting me. Can anybody guess why?
there's no key on the student table. So we don't have a primary key in the student table, therefore we can't create a foreign key because we have no keys. So I'm going to edit my student table. Throw in student number. It's going to be an integer. And it's the primary key. And I don't want this one. Like that. And um, now it's at the end, which is just fantastic. Let's move it to the top because I don't like my keys further down. And as you just saw, it actually created the foreign key automatically. I don't want that. I want to demonstrate what it was actually going to do. Ooh, loud. So again, it's going to be a one to many non identifying. So you click on the child, you click on the parent. That's how it works in MySQL Workbench. Other software, you click on the parent, you click on the child. It just depends on the software. So with MySQL, if you're trying to do the creating the relationship, you are going to go click on the child, say, OK, now I'm going to click on who owns this table, as in who is the parent of this table. So you go from the child to the parent. So that's you know how MySQL rolls. And you know, you'd create all your other relationships as applicable. Now, one of the relationships um, that is always fun is the many to many. And as you can see, it actually created another object for you automatically because you cannot have many to many in a physical diagram. You can do it at the conceptual stage, but physically it's impossible to do a many to many. Um, I'm actually going to discuss what this is in a bit, what this one was, but I wanted to at least show you guys what happens when you do a many to many. So we're going to specify the logic for enforcing minimum cardinality one to one, many to one, one to many. Uh, by the way, many to one and one to many is the exact same thing. It just depends what side of the equation you're looking at it from, right? For example, for me, it's a one-to-many relationship, but depending how you want to look at it, that's a many-to-one relationship, right? Many students, one teacher, one teacher, many students. It's the same thing. M-O and O-M is the same thing. Then you got the many-to-many, -many, which is what I just did. I'm pretty sure there's a slide that covers that topic in here. So if we were to just go creating the entity from this, and the example they've got on the screen, literally all they've done is made the employee number the primary key. So, yay, it's the same thing, the same table. However, at this point, we're going to create the primary key. Um, an ideal primary key is short, numeric, and fixed. Surrogate keys are great to meet the ideal. Uh, apparently, they have two disadvantages to users. Um, the first one is they have no meaning to a user, and they should not. Honestly, if you're using a surrogate key, it should have absolutely no meaning to a user, ever. And that's perfectly okay. It's not really a disadvantage. It's just when people are used to using one way of doing data, whereas in, I always look up my customers using an email address. Instead, the customer shows up with their customer number. I don't know. Um, I don't know how many of you have experienced this at Canadian Tire. When they ask you, do you know, do you collect Canadian Tire money? And they want your card, and you don't have your card, and you give them their phone number, right? Um, I actually threw one of them for a loop points because I actually gave them my membership number. And they're like, uh, I don't know how to put that in. But that was a generated number because it was my membership number because they were so used to working with something that wasn't the IDs. Um, the only time things get weird with story keys is if there's multiple database systems and the data has to get shared across them. Suddenly, you know, the numbers may not get generated the same in both places and suddenly you'll have a disconnect. And even that's arguable if you're using other stuff to uniquely identify people like an email address, as in, 
an email address can go into the system only once. That can be carried across multiple systems or if they're using credit card numbers or SIN numbers or something else. It's one of the few times where an identifier, real world identifier has its purpose. So candidate key and alternate keys are synonymous. Candidate keys are alternate identifiers for unique rows. Um, There is the ability to have alternate keys when you look at a customer. For example, you could have a name or a city as an alternate key. Um, those end up being um, indexes, so you can look them up. So when you use AKN.M, the first number is the alternate key number. The second one is um, the column number. Honestly, it's not something that's used very much. It's when you are trying to, when you're taking something like this, where you have a bunch of candidate keys, and you're like, well, the candidate key is an email address, but realistically, the email address isn't unique enough, so we're going to create a surrogate key. But we want to keep track of the fact that maybe the email address is an alternative way of finding people into the system. That's what it's for. Realistically, once it's the physical design is run out and implemented, alternate keys just become uh, columns you search on, and that's all. Uh, null status, oh, I covered that one. Can it be empty or not? So, the employee number cannot be empty. The name cannot be empty. Phone number could be null. Email address could be null. Their hire date cannot be null. and Review date and their employee code may be null because they haven't been given an employee number yet or an employee code. So essentially, what we need to be able to populate this record is an employee number, their name, and when they were hired. Who cares if we can't contact them? They're on the payroll. They'll contact us when we don't pay them. So now we're going to get into uh, data types. And <laughs> person who wrote this slide um, grabbed the wrong slide. Some of these data types are for uh, Microsoft SQL Server. So there are generic uh, data types. There's car. And I'm going to skip the N1 because the N1 is specific to Microsoft SQL Server. So I just want to stick to the generic ones. So Car. The character field is a fixed length string. So if you say character five, so car bracket five, a bit like when I did this in here where, and no, shift, no, alt. There we go. There's the, there's the zoom. You can see right here in this case is var car, but I stated the size of the var car. When you look at it via car five, that means it's a character field that can hold a maximum value five characters long. And the funny thing is about cars is that they will always occupy five bytes. Even if you only put in the letter A, it will still take up the space of five bytes. Yeah, I know five bytes isn't very big. But you got to think back in the day, way back in the day, when computers had hard drives measured in megabytes and not three digit megabytes. I had a friend, he had a 40 megabyte hard drive in his first computer. That's what, 10 pictures on my cell phone. But that, that was the entire thing, OS and all. Kind of cool how much things have changed. Those five bytes are really important. So the reason fixed length character fields came to existence actually is because even before hard drives. Okay, I'm sure everybody in here has seen at least one really old movie where they had big computers and you actually saw the tapes rolling. What was cool about those computer systems was when you, the database system that read the tapes would know 
that there's five bytes for each of those fields. So we knew exactly how many millimeters to move the tape to get to the next field for five bytes. It would literally go, boop, read five, boop, read five, boop, read five, because it always knows how big five was. So when it was reading the value out of a five character field, it would literally just move the tape, the distance it would be for the five pieces of information. Which was good for tape systems. But somewhere along the way, people realized we're running out of room really fast. So they came up with something called variable character fields, VARCAR. The way VARCAR works is you define the maximum length, but it only stores the number of bytes being used. So if you define something as VARCAR 50, it will use, but you only put in the letter A, it will use one byte plus a little bit. Um, different database systems do this a little bit differently, but basically it's telling the database server that data in this field ends here. So it's like a termination marker. Um, it's a bit like a, uh, you know, chucks, when you have a, put a car on the ramps and you put chucks behind the wheels to keep it from rolling backwards. Same idea. The database server will read that data. It sees the chuck and stops. And he goes, okay, I've got all the data I need because I've seen the magic set of bytes, that the bits that tell me this is enough. So that's a VARCAR field. So it's really good if you've got long sets of values, but you only want parts of it. It's to represent the real world. Postal code in Canada is six characters long. It's not 26. Therefore, you try to make the data match what the real world holds. Not an identifier, it's a descriptor. But a 10. Yeah. Well it'll get it'll be it'll get to 10 and then there's no more. Uh, but if it's less than 10, then the termination marker is in there. I mean, like I said, each database server does this a little bit differently. So I just use the phrase, a termination marker or a chuck as a generic placeholder of there's some little piece of magic sauce in each database engine that says when it reaches the end of a bar car, it sees this and it knows it's done reading data for that field. So I picture it like how you have in Java, where you have a string in Java and a string can only hold so much data. But you only put a few things in it, but Java knows that it only has those pieces of information because somehow it knows in memory it occupies only these bytes. Similar idea, except it physically gets written to the disk. A date. I think that's pretty straightforward. It's a date. Same thing with a time. Uh, what they don't have in here, though, is a date time field, which is a combination of date and time which is infinitely more useful than date or time by themselves because it occupies less room and it's easier to query because you're only dealing with one field. Integers. I sure as heck hope you guys all know what an integer is. Now, a decimal, numeric, and money, Depending on the database server you're talking about, they all do the same thing. Here's the catch, though. Not all database servers support money. So I always recommend don't use the money data type because it it's not portable. Or different database servers will do the money data type differently, like totally different behavior. Rounding rules will be different, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, for example, in Postgres, you define a field as money. You don't get to define how many decimal places it has because it's getting two decimal places because it's money. A decimal field, on the other hand, which by the way is the same thing as a numeric, different database servers, they're the same thing. They allow you to define how long the number is and how many of those digits are reserved for decimal places. So I'm gonna go back to MySQL Workbench really quick and I will add a column in here called fees. And I'm gonna make that a uh, numeric 10 comma two. And I don't want that one. And I'm gonna close this so you guys can actually see it. Okay, so we got our fees. It's a decimal 10 comma two. 
Let me just move my mouse a bit. So this is saying that this can hold a total of 10 digits. But out of those 10, two are reserved for decimal places. So that means that it can hold, I should have done a smaller one because I'm going to hate myself. Nine, ten, that's what it's going to hold. So this is the ten, this is the two. Okay? That's the, yeah. so anything from the period over is going to be the second digits in the definition of the decimal place, the decimal number. And this is when programmers that have never touched databases, suddenly their minds explode. Because in languages like Java and you know C, you have floats, you have reals, and you have integers. Can you tell a float or a real just how many decimal places you're allowed to have? No, it's just going to hold a big freaking number, and it doesn't care about rounding. That will do the rounding for you automatically. Why make the database, why make the programmers work harder than they need to if the database will take care of it for you? So decimal play, decimals are great for handling money. They're great for handling other things. And by the way, you can go really freaking big with these. Uh, depending on the database engine, uh, some of these numbers are absolutely insane, the size of it. Same thing. They're the same. They're semantically the same. And depending on the database engine, money is the same thing as a decimal and a numeric. But in others, it's not. So that's why I tell people, stay away from the money data type, because it's not generic enough. If you stick to car, var car, date, date time, integer, decimal, numeric, and there's one more called text. It will cover you for everything you'll ever, ever need. So when we go back to our employees table, we decided employee number is an integer. The name was a var car 50. The phone number is a car 15. Um, honestly, most modern database systems, there's no reason to use cars anymore. Just use a var car. Uh, I know for MySQL, Postgres, and Microsoft SQL Server, there is no performance difference. Might make a difference in Oracle, though. I don't use Oracle enough to be able to say that honestly, what, what, whether it makes a difference. Uh, you'll see that the higher date has, has a date, when is the review. Those are two things that are actually good to not necessarily have a time. Uh, it's one of the rarities. Another example I like to use is a person's date of birth. Who cares what time you were born at? Other than the doctor needing it for his files, all you ever need to know about a person's when they were born is the day they were born. It's not like I'm going to say, oh, at 351, congratulations, you're a year older now. That's, you know, irrelevant. Um, same thing with the hire date, you only care when they started. And the review date, you only care when the next review is going to happen, that kind of thing. So I'm not going to go through all of these. They're there for your personal reference. Well, you can see that MySQL has two pages of data types in these slides. Um, I will highlight a few in here, though, uh, that are kind of handy. If you got a big integer and you make it unsigned, in other words, we're not reserving room for the negative, you can fit a number that big in it. That's a big freaking integer, I got to say. Um, you got you know all these little integers from here to there. Um, MySQL eight finally got booleans. Uh, they don't really work, but they're there. Uh, every other database server actually has booleans, um, except uh, database booleans are a little different from what you guys are used to thinking. If you do a boolean in Java, it can be only one of two things, right? True or false. In a database, it can be null. So it can be yes, no, or I don't know. So it's actually a triphase Boolean, which is kind of cool. 
Uh, I have exploited that capability many times over the years. That's part of my day job. Um, because sometimes I don't know is the right answer. Um, it supports floats just like in you know your normal programming languages. It, they've got double precision, single precisions. Um, you got date and time types. Uh, you got date time, which is handy. Uh, Timestamps are a little different. Uh, it, it's very limited. Um, supports a year type. Like honestly. I've never seen the point of a year type because never have I only ever worried about what year something happened. Uh, but maybe it's because I only deal with business systems and I need to know when things happen down to the second. Uh, you got tons of string types and they've got something called a blob and you'll see a tiny blob, big blob, see documentation here. Yeah. Don't ever use blobs. I'm going to say it right now. Um, blobs stand for binary large object. It's as if you're going to shove a JPEG a picture into the database. It's a terrible idea. Uh, the only time you want to use a blob is if you need to store raw bytes in the database. So let's say you're receiving uh, a piece, uh, you have a piece of encrypted data. Encrypted data often has a bunch of random bytes in it then you need to store it as is so that the database doesn't try to convert those random bytes into something it understands that's the only time you use blobs is if you need to put things inside that the database must leave inviolate it cannot be touched um, and then you got text text is for lots of t lots of letters numbers spaces characters MySQL is stupid for this, and I'll put it right out there right now. MySQL is dumb as a post because every other database system has a type called text, unless, of course, it's Microsoft SQL Server, then it's called memo because of access, I guess. But text means it'll hold lots. Um, in, for example, in a database server called Postgres, a text field is able to occupy space till you run out of disk space on your hard drive in one field. Obviously, you're never going to do that. But in theory, it's doable. MySQL, on the other hand, said, you know, we're going to be clever boys when we make it. So they created something called tiny text, medium text, long text. Regular text is the same thing as a medium text. Tiny text is like, I don't remember off the top of my head. It's something like a thousand characters. And the long text is what every other database server calls text. So that's MySQL. Um, you got things like enums and set values. Uh, set values are really weird. Uh, don't use them. Uh, they do not, they're not portable. They don't go from one server to the other. Um, no, yeah, you. Yeah, if you're dealing with MySQL, you're going to use long text. Everywhere else, you use text. Um, how did I discover? Because I never even realized there was such a thing until you know years and years ago, where I was writing a system and suddenly everything I was bringing in was getting cut off. And I couldn't figure out why it was being cut off until I went digging and I discovered that I was truncating all my text fields. Uh, because MySQL decided 65,000 characters is enough for everybody. Unless you tell me otherwise. Okay. So once you've done your table, you'll have your data type, null, not null. You'll have identifying if it's a key. So essentially, this is a physical design. When it's a logical design, the only difference between this and the logical design is there's no, no data types. So when somebody says, oh, I got a logical diagram for you, it's literally this without the data types. Add on the data types, now you have a physical design. Now, a default value is the value that's supplied by the database when a new row is created. And we have an item called, we have an item, we have a table called item in this example. And the item number is a surrogate key. 
And the other ones, and here's some other um, basic rules they've set up. Um, item numbers and storage key. In other words, it gets the next value automatically. So you just think of a clicker. A person ran by, click. Person runs by, click. Person runs by, click. Next number gets used. Uh, the category has no default values. But you can get really fancy with uh, some of these rules. So if you have a category and it's called perishable, it can actually create a prefix automatically for P. So the rule is saying if the category is set to perishable, the only value allowed in item prefix is P. If the category is imported, it becomes I. If its category is equal to 1 O, then it's O. Otherwise, it defaults to N. Um, database servers will implement some of these rules differently. The language they use may be different, which is why this is written in pseudocode on this example. Um, you can set up rules saying if the item prefix is I, then um, it's shipping and purchasing. Otherwise, it defaults to purchasing uh, as per the department. And the shipping method, if the item prefix is P, as in perishable, it's set to next day. Otherwise, it goes out through regular ground. You can actually get the database to auto-populate the data based on the data in other columns by following, by defining default rules. Um, now, I will be completely honest. This is rare in modern database systems. In the old school database systems, when people were using dumb terminals, it or the really the old web the old web apps way back in the day where they're using CGI scripts, it made sense to do it right in the database. But the problem is that let's just say suddenly a manager says we have a brand new category of product. That means it needs a new prefix. In a modern system, they literally go click admin add category prefix is equal to you know something. If it's embedded right in the database, that means you got to get the database designer to come in and modify the database on the server. It could work. It could go horribly wrong. Then you do it offline. You got to wait for it to replicate across the cluster. In the meantime, other stuff might get broken. You know, you got to be careful. It's it's got its place, but I don't. It doesn't happen as often as it used to. Um, so we have a few different constraints. Those are limitations on the data values. So when you hear about somebody saying there's data constraints, these are the limits on the data values. A domain constraint limits the values to a particular set of values. So remember a little bit back when I said Amazon won't let you order negative number of items? You cannot order minus three PlayStation 5s. It feels like that right now, still in Canada, but you cannot order minus three PlayStation 5s. It must be one or more. That is a domain constraint. In other words, the value in this field must be at least one. A range constraint means the minimum is one, maximum is five. That's a range. So you put an upper and a lower limit on what's allowed to be allowed in there. Uh, Interrelation constraints limits a column's value in comparison to values to other um, columns in the same table. This right here. Right, saying if the category is equal to perishable, then the value and item prefix must be P. That's an intra-relation constraint. An inter-relation constraint means the value in that column must exist in another table, also known as a foreign key. That's literally a fancy way of saying foreign key is an inter-relation constraint. Um, Heck, I already did this. I did it while I was demonstrating drawing a relationship on in my scale workbench. So that's the one to one, one to n. Primary key on one side of the relationship belongs to the foreign key on the many side. Um, in other words, one side is the parent, the other side is the child. So 
the key comes from the parent, gets fed to the child. Um, transforming one to end relationship between strong entities. The if this is the concept, this was what becomes in the physical. So the member number comes in and is added in as a foreign key. So remember earlier I was talking about how you know the member number is going to show up in the physical design. So when we talk about creating a you know two strong entities, the member number here when it's added to the club uniform becomes a column or an, a or an attribute here of a for and it's a foreign key. That is when you're creating foreign keys. That is a interrelational constraint. The foreign key. Um, so in an NM strong entity relationship, there's no place for foreign keys in either table. A company may supply many parts. Each part can be supplied to many companies. The solution is to create an intersection table. Man, that's a that's the fourth phrasing for that I've seen. Um, I will list off the other ways, the other words that are used for this in a moment. Uh, but it's an intersection table that contains data from both corresponding rows into the entity in the middle. Uh, the intersection table consists of only the primary keys of the each table plus a composite, which turns into a composite primary key. Um, by the way, this phrase is uh, a little misleading. Um, there's some modern basic rules in business systems now that that makes that a lie. Now, how many of you have ever heard about Enron? Hey, good. At least two people. One person rolled their eyes. One person put their hand up. Enron. Okay. How about if any of you have heard about how Nortel cooked the books? Okay. There you go. We got a little more reactions on that one. Well. It's gone to the point where there's auditing required on pretty much every piece of data a large corporation has. So an intersection table no longer is just two keys. It also has to have dates and who did it. And it actually has to keep a history of those changes. So yes, theoretically, when you're first starting out, an intersection table is the two foreign keys that make up the other one. In other words, this. So earlier I tried to do a many-to-many -many between student and courses, and they didn't let me. What they did do is they created a new table for me, and what was in this table? The primary keys of the two parent tables. So the way you resolve a many-to-many -many relationship, and I do a physical gesture when I describe this, so you got a crow's foot, right? It's like this, many-to-many, -many, right? So this table is related to this side many times. This side is related to this many times. To resolve it, you actually need it to become like this, where you got singles on the outside with many pointing, both many's pointing in the middle. So if you need a physical, you know, if your conceptual diagram looks like this, the physical diagram will look like this. So it's saying that each student can be in this table multiple times. Each course can be in this table multiple times. The combination of a course and a student can only exist once in that table. So each of you guys take multiple courses. Each course has multiple students. However, you can only ever be enrolled at each course once. So you can't take 8215 section 300, 8215 section 310. 8215 section 330, you can't attend all three lectures. That's what the intersection table does. Um, other words I've heard for an intersection table is it has and belongs to many table, habitum table. That's one phrase I've heard. I've also heard it called a uh, cross reference table, a resolving table, and a, um, oh man, I can't remember the last one I've heard it called. Anyways, essentially, it's a bridge table. That's the other one I've heard. So you have one table that bridges a many-to-many -many relationship to another table. But for the intents and purposes of the slides, tests, and whatever for this course, it's an intersection table. And there's literally 
the example. So in the conceptual and logical diagram, we had the foreign key, the primary keys were defined. It's a many to many. We don't know what the foreign key is going to be because we can't. So what we do is we create a table. And in here is the, the primary key is the combination of the primary keys of the two parents. So this is conceptual. This is physical. Because it is physically, there is, I've only ever heard of one database server that allows many-to-many -many relationships. And I don't remember what it's called. The last time I ran across it was 20-something years ago. Someone's saying, yeah, my database server that I use is the best because it lets me do many-to-many. -many. It allows it. I'm like, dude, such a terrible idea. There's a reason why none of the others allow it. Well, no, is it creates another whole table. Like, this is many-to-many. To be able to resolve it in a physical table, you need another table in the middle. It's, yeah. Well, sort of. But when you're doing the conceptual, which is why often I say when you're doing the conceptual diagram, don't put in the foreign keys. Because then you're not sitting there adding extra attributes that really don't belong there. I know. Well, that's okay. Because you're learning. So normally when you do a conceptual diagram, you don't always include the foreign keys, specifically because you haven't resolved them yet. How do you end up resolving them? Is when you do the physical, you create a new table to handle it. But database design software will do it for you. One of the pieces of software that I use for my day job actually allows you to diagram on the physical diagram many to many, but it won't let you export it until you resolve it. And then you can click on the right click on the relationship, say resolve, and then it creates the table for you. Whatever. Um, it's just tools. Uh, I guarantee draw.io will not resolve it for you. It, it expects you to actually understand what it what's happening. So, four uses for ID-dependent entities, also known as uh, weak identifying relationships. Uh, it, it allows you to represent many-to-many. -many. Uh, let's uh, do associations, multi-valued attributes, and archetype and instance relations. And I, if I remember, you guys have a hybrid about those last two phrases. Uh, that'll be in your next set of hybrids. Don't worry about it. Um, an intersection table holds a relationship between two strong entities. That is in a many, many relationship. That's literally what I just finished talking about. Um, an association table. So an intersection table holds only the, the, two, prim the two primary keys, the composite keys. In theory, you could actually have three in there if you got a three-way, you know. An associative table, an association table, basically is an intersection table plus. So they will have one or more columns of attributes specific to the association of the other two. So a moment ago, I talked about Nortel and Enron and how everything they do now must have extra pieces of information on it. As in, who created that relationship? When was that creation that relationship created? Um, you know, was it deleted? Who deleted it? When was it last modified? That kind of thing. That's known as an association table. So what is the difference between an intersection table and an association table? An association table is an intersection table plus. So it's an intersection with extra information that helps you describe that relationship better. Um, yeah, that's literally what that is. So. We have an example here where it goes, it shows, here's, these are association ones. And I don't know why, what's the difference between the two? So the same diagrams in here twice, A, B, two, three. Uh, uh. Oh, okay, conceptual, physical. I'm only gonna worry about the physical one. So you've got the part number and the company name. 
The part number and company name, I'm going to move out of the way for the people because I'm blocking the screen for some of you. The part number and the company name here are fed from here and here, but it's also got an extra attribute called price. So for example, um, if anybody's ever worked in purchasing, you know that anything you pay from a supplier is negotiable. If you've got somebody who's really, really good at plying the supplier, you'll get a good discount. A good supplier will hire people that, you know, don't change prices after they're drunk. It's just different skills for almost the same job. So it's saying that, you know, brake pads going to Delari Mitsubishi are sold at this price. But the exact same brake pads going to Joe, you know, shop down the road that's, you know, mom and pop shop, he might be paying a different price for the same brake pads. So this is why this is an association association table, because it associates the other two tables, but it adds a little extra color to it, a little more flavor. Um, this is way more common in the industry than straight up intersection tables. And just because we like to make things impossible to read, um, this is a three-way. So you've got one table, two tables, three tables that feed into an associative table and with the hours worked. And this is actually very similar to um, some of the temp entry stuff I do at my day job. We have employee, project, and then uh, the tasks. Because, you know, for different projects, you do different tasks as developers. You know, sometimes you're doing documentation, sometimes you're debugging, sometimes you are. And we need to track that. So when we bill our customers, we bill them appropriately because we have different rates for different tasks. So this is just like this one, except they decided to add a third table. So you got three keys plus a little bit of color. So. When we're designing maximum cardinality, and I'm stopping in five minutes regardless of where I'm at, so I can talk about the assignment. Um, design for maximum cardinality. Uh, relationships can have optional mandatory, and you can have parent optional, child mandatory, you know, mandatory on both sides. Um, when it's MM, that means the both sides are mandatory. Um, so. The actions to enforce minimum cardinality, when you're inserting a row into a child table, nothing is required to be done to the parent table. If you don't supply the, the parent to the child, it's going to bomb out and say no. That's the mandatory. Uh, if you're modifying a key, you can change the child's keys to match. If you can't, don't allow it. Um, and vice versa, if the foreign key doesn't exist, don't allow it. Um, and for the delete, you can't delete the children. Um, don't allow it. You can't delete the parent if the kids still exist, unless you allow cascade deletes. Uh, that is something you can do. Um, so yes. The cascade delete is really dangerous, by the way. That's family genocide. You wipe out the parents and the kids and the grandkids and anything related to them. You burn to the ground. Um, if the child is not mandatory, it reverses the other way around. You know, if you can't insert the parent without the child, which by the way, is almost physically impossible to do in a database server. Um, adding a parent without the child or adding a child without the parent is almost mutually exclusive. Uh, you have to be really fancy to pull that one off unless you're using uh, non-synthetic keys. Um, if you modify the keys, Update the foreign key of the child, otherwise don't allow it. If it's the last kid, good enough. 
Um, if it's not the last child, you have to find a replacement. So if you don't like your last kid, get a new one. If you delete, nothing happens on the parent. But if you go to delete the child records, you have to check every parent, and make sure they're not related to that parent. If there's any parents still related to that kid, you can't delete the kid. Man, this sounds like a John Wick movie. So, so there's database design that covers relationships on multiple um, items. So, on the left, we have an identifying relationship. So the company name is here. So this is a strong entity. And the way they did uh, this is they set up the strong entities to be green and the others to not be green. Um, so the company exists on its own. It's got phone contacts. It requires a contact as part of this. So this is a weak entity because it cannot exist without the company name. Um, the department cannot exist without the company name. Again, that's a weak entity. However, an employee can exist without the department name because theoretically, uh, if anybody here has ever worked for the government, you know how sometimes you get hired and you don't even know what department you're in until you basically show up the first day. That's because they didn't know what department you belonged to until you got hired. A lot of those hiring pools. Have, have you ever seen the hiring pools for? Okay. So if ever you have the joy of looking through the job postings for the government of Canada jobs, you'll see themselves to see hiring pools. And they will accept 10,000 applications, reduce it to 5,000, reduce it again, maybe interview 150 people, and then they'll say, we're going to hire 50 of those 150 people. Well, we don't know exactly where they're going to work at, but we want those 50 people. Then you get hired. And then on your first day, you'll find out where you're going to work. Just Government of Canada thinks. So that's what's happening here is the employee is a strong entity because it exists on its own. So this is not an identifying relationship. However, the department name is, if you're going to put something in the department name, it must exist here. And that's basically that. Then you just give it data types. Um, how many slides am I at? Oh, oh yeah, I'm going to finish it. There are only two slides left. Cascading updates and deletes. Cascading updates happen when a change happens to the, prim the parent's primary key, and it has to be applied to all the child records. By the way, that is a terrible thing. All it takes is one error somewhere, and your whole database is a shit show. This is where surrogate keys come in. If you think that you're ever going to change the value of the parent's primary key, don't use that as a key. Get a surrogate key because they will never need to change. Why? They have no real world meaning. It's It only has meaning to the database engine itself. Therefore, nothing outside of the database engine will care what those IDs are. On the other hand, if you use somebody's SIN number as their identifier and there's a bunch of child records tied to the SIN number and you need to change your SIN number, that means they got to update all the child records that depend on it too. Um, I know that for a long time, RBC used your SIN number as your unique customer identifier. Made sense? Because, you know, you required a SIN number to open a bank account. You don't anymore, but you did back then. And hmm, that having been said, Whenever your SIN number changes, it doesn't happen very often, but all it takes is one solid case of identity theft, where it's your SIN number that got compromised. You're getting a new SIN number. You used to actually have to go to the bank and say, I need to change my SIN number. It could take up to three weeks for them to process it because there were so many cascading updates that they only did them once a month because it was such an intensive task. Um, I used to know someone that worked in the data centers at RBC. That's why I know specifically that example. Um, a cascading delete is when associated child rows are deleted along with the parent. So you have an order with order lines in the system. You delete the order, the order lines disappear. A cascading delete is great 
um, because we don't have orphans. Orphan records are bad because they're floating, not attached to anything. So they have no meaning, but they're just occupying space. So when you're talking about strong entities, so if you have one strong entity feeding to another strong entity, example, again, car parts, you don't cascade delete strong entities. In other words, if there's a strong entity that feeds into another strong entity, you don't cascade delete because the other one can exist without the first one. If it's a weak entity, so you got a strong entity that feeds into a weak entity, normally you're going to do cascade deletes at that point. In other words, you get rid of the parent, get rid of the child record, so there's no orphans that cannot stand on their own. And when we do them, the actions, this is the, uh, you know, one to one, there's nothing to do. Many to one, it does the parent required actions. It enforces database. It's easily enforced by the database rules. Um, one to many, there's child stuff to be done. It's hard to enforce. Uh, you're probably going to end up having application code or triggers to take care of it. Um, many to many. That means that this is where, you know, that case, the parts and the suppliers and the vendors where you got, you know, an intersection table between them. Those can be really hard to enforce because let's say you go and you delete a part by accident, it'll go and delete that part from all the other supplier, like everybody who uses it. That might've been a mistake. So it's really hard to implement. So normally when you have many to many relationships, you're not gonna use cascading deletes because it can really cascade badly. Um, they can lock each other out. There's all kinds of things that can go wrong with it. Okay. Now, for the fun part. Assignment one. It should not be visible to you guys. Under assignments, listed as assignment one, there is a big block of text. I actually do have a PDF of this for you guys to have separate. There are several things attached to that doc to that assignment. To get to the files, you actually click on the assignment header to bring you in. It's just my view is quite different from your view. So if I click on it, it's going to mean nothing to you. However, you're going to form groups. Congratulations. I hate group work as much as you do. I hate dealing with the politics, but I love the fact that I only have to grade one assignment per group. You guys hate them because you got to find group members. And you're all level ones. So, you know, you may only know so many people you're willing to sign up with. However, uh, groups of two or three, uh, it is an awful lot of work for one person to do by themselves. Unless you've got some experience in the database field, it's not going to be, a, it's going to be rough. You will submit four files. And there is a design document that has business rules, unknowns, and assumptions. Um, it has, there has to be a Word document or a PDF. I will not accept app Mac pages documents. Sorry, that's not happening. Um, so either a Word document or PDF. Um, you're going to give me a conceptual ERD as a PNG or a JPEG, like one of those. And then you will give me physical ERD, which is the one that has all the fields and the foreign keys and everything else properly named uh, data types also as a PNG. And then an export, and I will give you guys better instructions how to do the export next week. Um, from the database design, in other words, from my SQL workbench, it's possible for you to ex export an SQL file out of it. Uh, that SQL file will be used for me and a code checker. Uh, that's just to make sure that I don't have two groups submitting the exact same piece of work. Because the odds of it being identical between two groups is pretty small. Uh, so small that it's, you know, if I asked all the groups in here to write me a different fiction story and you all gave me the exact same fiction story, that's how small the odds are. 
Okay, so this has three scenarios. You get to pick one. So download all three, read through them, make sure you understand what's being asked, pick one, and that's the one you're going to work on. I guarantee that one of the ones that people will think is easy is probably the hardest one. Every year I get a group of students that go, oh, I'm going to take the pizza shop one because it's so easy. No, it's the hardest one. Just warning you now. Unless you've worked in, a, in the food industry and specifically in a, in a kind of a place where a person can customize every single thing they can order, you have no idea how complicated it gets. All right. Um, it's broken down. There's 14 points for the design document, 22 points for the conceptual diagram, and 30 points for the physical diagram. When this assignment was designed, we decided to give you guys lots of points to lose. Why? It's more forgiving. The original version of this assignment was scored out of 20. You know, even losing half a mark was a significant, you know, could be the difference between an A and a B, depending on, you know, where that half a mark went. The odds of losing one mark out of uh, 50, 66 points and it dropping you a letter grade is smaller. Um, there is pretty good examples of what you need in here, including, you know, what are the business rules? Uh, two things we didn't really talk about up till now was what unknowns and assumptions are. When you are working with a database design, you are given a, a document, a series of documents, and you're going to read through them. And you're going to go, these are things I don't know for a fact. Therefore, when I did this design, it was based on the assumptions that I don't really know what this is. And therefore, if you have an unknown, often you have an assumption. You're saying, I don't know what this is, but I'm going to assume this is what it is. And that's what the design is based on. So if you have anything weird in your design, if you list off your unknown and your assumptions and they make sense based to what you gave me, you're not going to lose points because you documented the unknowns. Um, the grading is broken down in detail. I am not going to go through this point by point. As you can see, it's quite detailed on how everything's broken down. Um, I will gladly take questions next week if after you've read through this and had a chance to digest this a bit more. Uh, the conceptual diagram. You're going to give me a diagram. I do recommend you use ERD Plus because it works really, really good. Um, for those of you that have tried it, it's one of the easiest diagramming tools for ERDs conceptual. And that one's worth 22 points broken down as follows. And there's a physical diagram. Again, you're going to give me a diagram as first properly normalized, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the grading is broken down appropriately. Um, there is Three scenarios. One, two, three. So the first scenario is a manufacturing plant. And there's a, a set of rules. And these guys are actually, they almost give you your business rules. You just need to clean them up a little bit. And they give you samples of what their data looks like. So you're going to basically look at what's provided. Write out your business rules and your unknowns and unknowns and assumptions. Do your conceptual diagram and then do your physical diagram. I will be in lab if you're not sure. That's what I'm there for. Therefore, I'll help you guys sort that out. The second one is the pizza shop. I've warned everybody this one's a trap. It's a cool one to do because you really do get an appreciation for many to many relationships in this one. Um, used to be the best pizza shop in the West End. They just sold the shop. Not as good as they used to be. It's unfortunate. I have to find you a pizza shop. Um, but they were, you know, you see a menu. Everybody in here has probably seen a pizza menu by now. It shouldn't be a mystery. Um, the, the reason why the pizza shop one is picked over, say, 
uh, a shawarma shop menu or an Indian restaurant menu or even a Chinese food restaurant menu is none of those other places lets you customize the way a pizza shop lets you customize. Thin crust, thick crust, lots of sauce, little sauce, white sauce, lots of cheese, a little bit of cheese, no cheese. Um, do you want one topping, no toppings? 25 toppings. Do you want the grossest pizza on earth? We can do that. Do you want Parmesan cheese or not? Just think about it, how complicated ordering a pizza is. People don't think about how complicated ordering a freaking pizza is. It's complicated. Um, do you want a foot long, half long sub? Do you want lettuce on the sub or not? Extra cheese, extra sauce. Just think about it. Yes, it's a fantastic exercise, but it's, I will be completely honest, it's one of the harder ones. Yeah, I know. And then scenario three is actually an old scenario from way back that used to be used for years in the industry. Uh, it was actually, uh, used to be called the Di Dead President High School scenario because it was actually based in the U.S. And I took the time to rename it to Dead Prime Minister High School uh, just to make it a little more local. Um, you will be given uh, data based on what their staff understands the data to be. And you will design a database design based on this information they gave you. All three scenarios have their pluses and their minuses. The manufacturing one is probably the most explicit, but by the same token, you're most restricted because they're so explicit. The high school one is something that most people in here will understand. Why? Because probably most of you have gone to high school. Some of these things are actually a bit of a mystery to um, um, international students because it doesn't always, there's certain things that we do in Canadian high schools that may not apply to international students and vice versa. Uh, mandatory club membership is not a thing in Canada, but you know, in a lot of schools in Japan it is. Um, I remember a couple of years ago when I ran a very similar <laughs> assignment and they talked about disciplinary actions taken against a student. I had a student from uh, China look at me and goes, what's a disciplinary action? What, you never got in trouble at school? No. They had no idea what that meant, being in trouble at school. On the other hand, I spent many hours in the principal's office because of my son. You know, it got to the point where I was a first name basis of the principal. That's not a good sign. International students are looking and going, what does that mean? Take my word for it. You don't want to be there as a parent. And I was there way too much. So this one is good, but it may have things you are not familiar with. And you may not realize some of the implications of the interrelations between them, but by the same token, some of the stuff is stuff you're familiar with because you've gone through school. Those are the three scenarios. So what is your next step for this assignment? By next week, you must tell me who your group members are. I will be creating groups in Brightspace. Brightspace has a group mode for assignments. So that will mean that as a group, you will submit through the group tool for the assignment and only one person needs to submit it. The cool part for me is I grade it. I give you guys your grade and publish. Everybody in the group gets their grade instantly with the same feedback. So less grading for me, which is good because I've got a lot of assignments to grade. And it's good for you guys because you only have one submission you need to do. Just make sure the person actually submits it. So what I want you to do is email me with your group members. By next week, if you cannot find a group member by Monday, email me so that I can reach out and ask for who else is willing to be a group member? Who else is looking for group members? So I can, you know, do a do a uh, Craigslist uh, missed connections moment and see if I can get that to work. I got two questions, one there, one there. You were first. Louder. It, it's online now. Yeah, it's alive now. Okay, I'll have to check. 
15th of October. Jeez, everybody just 